Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and we're doing another video to help you improve your chess game. Today I'd like to talk about the relationship between board vision and visualization. If you haven't seen my earlier videos on visualization, on board vision, on the different types of chess vision, they're sort of prerequisites for this video, but not really. This video could stand alone. So for those of you that didn't see the earlier videos, visualization is a well-known chess idea, which is keeping track of the chess pieces as you move them in your head while you're analyzing the position. For instance, in the movie or the TV series, The Queen's Gambit, when Beth was sitting there and visualizing, they very cleverly decided to show that as her moving giant pieces on the ceiling. So that was her visualizing the board as to what it would have looked like if the pieces had moved. So when you play a chess game, especially a slow chess game, which is the kind you want to play in order to become a better player, you're going to sit there and take your time and you're going to move the pieces in your head. And when you keep track of where they are when you're moving them, that's called visualization. Now, board vision is different. Board vision is simply looking at a board as it is right now without moving the pieces in your head and seeing all the things that are going on in the board. What are some of the things that could be going on? Well, the material count is something the pawn structure, I know how many open files there are, semi-open files, which king is safer, um, you know, what kind of pawns are they, are there weak pawns like backward pawns or double pawns or isolated pawns, are there pa good pawns like past pawns, connected pawns, uh, how many pawn islands are there, how good are the bishops, all those things are board vision. Board vision doesn't involve moving the pieces in your head like visualization does. Now, what's obvious is there's a strong connection between board vision and visualization. Board vision, which you get as you play and you do more puzzles and you play over games and you play games, your board vision slowly, slowly, slowly gets a little bit better and a little bit better. If you don't believe me, just take any person that just learned how to play chess in the last couple of weeks and give them, give them some board vision questions like what's the material balance or you know, how many checks does white have or something like that. And you'll see that they have a struggle trying to find those things. And as you get, as you play more and more, those kind of questions, which should be relatively easy, become, you know, easier as you play. And when you first start out, they're actually kind of difficult. So board vision is slowly improved over the years by staring at chess boards and trying to figure things out and looking at what things are doing. But what should also be obvious is if your board vision isn't very good, it's going to make your visualization kind of difficult too. Because if you're trying to keep track of where all the pieces are and what they're doing, then the more familiarity you have with the board and how the pieces go on the board, the easier it is to visualize. So even though those two things are completely different, visualization and board vision, improving your board vision will help you improve your visualization. Neither are trivial to improve just by, let's say, you know, picking up a book and saying, I'm going to read a chapter on improving my board vision. It, it doesn't really work that way. Any more than when you're learning how to read, to recognize words, you can't, you can't just be talked into recognizing words. You have to train your brain to see those patterns. So that's what's going to happen with board vision and visualization. Now, there's lots of uh, websites that purport to help you with your visualization. So if you Google uh, chess visualization exercises or chess visualization uh you know, help or whatever, you should be able to see some of these uh, websites that purport to help you. And, you know, you could try them if you'd like and see if they do. All right, so let's let's pick out a position or two from this random. I just picked the game from the latest tournament, uh, Diak against uh, Rajabov. Maybe I'm mispronouncing Diak. I'm not sure. It might be Dyash. But anyway, uh, let's pick out a couple of positions and do some board vision stuff with them. And then I'm going to go to a book that talks a lot about board vision, which is International Master Levitt's book, Genius in Chess. And we're going to do some board vision stuff from there. All right, let's go forward here. Let's go to move, I don't know, 16 and do some board vision stuff here. All right, so E4, E5, Knight F3, Knight C6, Roy Lopez, Berlin, Berlin Wall. Okay, we've got not the main line, but still black doesn't have any big problems. This is all book. Rajabov finally slowed down a little bit. Rook e8. 
bishop f4, queen takes, knight back. Okay, we're going to move 16. G6, knight b2, knight g7, queen d2, c6. All right, 16 moves. What do we have with our board vision? Well, the material is equal. Both sides have two bishops and a knight, a rook and a queen. Both sides have seven pawns. The pawn structure is symmetric, meaning both, pawn, both sides have pawns on the exact same files. Nobody has a, a pawn on the e-file, so the e-file is open. Obviously, black has the pawn on g6, while white doesn't have a pawn on g2, so they're not perfectly symmetric, but the, but the pawn structure is symmetric. The pawns are on the same files. White is controlling the e-file, but black's going to be able to neutralize that pretty easily. Uh, what we can see is that white has a very, very microscopic advantage. You know, black should have no trouble in equalizing the position. And it's going to be very hard for white to win because his control of the e-file is just temporary. And otherwise, he has no structural dis uh, advantages. So my board vision tells me e the both kings are, are relatively equally safe. And, you know, this game should end in a draw. All right, let's go ahead 10 moves and do the same kind of thing. See if things have changed. Okay. All right, so now we're into move 26. We still have the same pawn structure. I mean, the pawns have moved a little bit on the king side, but it's still symmetric pawn structure with a A, B, C, D, F, G, H against the same thing. The knights are on D3, D6. The white still has the queen on the E file now, but black can easily put his queen on the E file as well. Wouldn't be surprising if these two guys agree to a draw fairly quickly here. So there wasn't a lot of board vision stuff to look at this game. There's the offer of the queen trade. He says no. Now he says yes. Now black has the potential outside pass pawn. That's what my board vision tells me. So black has a microscopic advantage in that he can create an outside pass pawn, but that's not nearly enough in this kind of position. And now he can't. Now the pawns are symmetric. Everything's symmetric. Boy, what a nice time to agree to a draw. Do they do it? No. Oh, they want to go into a king and pawn endgame where black has those double pawns. I'm sure black's already calculated this is a trivial draw. And he comes up and white says, what are you going to do? And black says, I'll go back and forth while you do too. Nobody has any entry. And there's the draw. Of course, black had to figure that out before he made the final trade in knights. So that game didn't feature a lot of special board vision issues. Let's do one more before we go to the book. Uh, let's see here. We'll go to the name of the tournament, and we'll go window, lib list. Um, here's the tournament. Um, I guess we can go to game, uh, let's go to game uh, 22. So, I got to get the name of the tournament to do that. Uh, do, 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 do. It's GCT Romania 21. Okay, so examine GCT Romania 21 percent uh, 22. It says I spell, oh, GCT dash Romania. All right, copy, paste, let's put in the dash. All right, aren't you guys excited I get to do this in real time? All right, hold on, we'll pause it. All right, here's the game, Karawana Giri. Let's do the same thing. We'll go to move 16, 26 and see what's going on. Same kind of opening, but different line. This time we got the full Berlin Wall line. White plays the Queenie 2 line. Doesn't want to trade queens. Gee, black actually castles in the Berlin Wall line. You don't see that very often. There's move 16. All right, so what does our board vision tell us? All right, so the main thing our board vision tells us is black has the bishop pair. That means he has two bishops and white doesn't. Doesn't mean you have two bishops. It means you, do, you have it and the other person doesn't. 
white has a four on three kingside majority. Black has a four on three queenside majority, but the four on three is crippled because of the doubled C pawns. And as well known, the uh, bishop pair makes up for the uh, pawn difference. Uh, Black currently has his queen on the open file, but having your queen on an open file when there's rooks on the board and the rooks can challenge them is often not a good thing because white could play here rook to d1 and, and temporarily get control of the file. Not that it's going to mean that much. Black will just play something like queen to c8 and then rook to d8. Uh, white's bishop on e3 is attacking the a7 pawn, which is on pre's. But if white plays, bishop takes a7, then black plays b6 and blocks it in. There's my visualization on top of my board vision. So my board vision tells me that the a7 pawn is on prees. My visualization and my analysis tells me it's probably not takeable for white. Grandmaster Caruano probably did not play. Bishop takes a7. Uh, the knight has some nice squares. He can go to e4 in some lines. White's majority can roll with f4 and then maybe later g4 and f5, something like that. And, uh, you know, Black's got the bishop pair to compensate him. Caruana's got a lot less time. Let's go up to move 26, see what our board vision tells us there. See, White's trying to get his majority rolling. He now has a three on two. Got rid of the bishop pair. There's the majority rolling. <clears throat> Black goes there. Okay, so here's move 26. All right, so both sides still have their majorities, but white's majority has moved up a little bit. A lot of lower rated players would say, oh my goodness, white put up, pushed up those pawns in front of his king. He could, his king could be in a lot of trouble. Well, yes, but he has a queen and a rook around the king and his pawns are coming down the board, which creates some space advantage. His knight can get back in the game through c3, but then he can't go to e4 anymore because the bishop and the queen are holding it. So my board vision tells me that black's pieces are probably a little more active. White's pawns are still the better pawn structure. The knight on a4 needs to get back in the game. The material is roughly even, as we would expect from a grandmaster game. And uh, the pawn on c2 is attacked twice. It's guarded twice. The rook on d8 is controlling the open file. The queen <clears throat> on e2 is currently controlling the open e file. The F file for black is semi-open. The pawn on G4 is pinned, so the pawn on G4 is not really attacking the bishop on F5. We call that a sneaky pin because we can't take that bishop. So the bishop is temporarily safe. White can move the king, of course, so that if he moves the king to H2 or something, he's then threatening to take the bishop, and the bishop has to move. So that's a very possible move for white is to just move the king to H2. All right, so my board vision tells me that uh, things are relatively still dynamically equal. Let's see what happens for another 10 moves. Wow. Oh, he didn't sack the piece. The queen attacked the knight. All right. Now white has a new majority on the central files. Rook and pawn endgames are generally... Rook and single pawn endgames are generally fairly easily drawn by the defending side. Right now, black's the one defending more. But now black's about to win this pawn. So white's probably going to play something like rook checks and then rook takes. In fact, this is move 36. So my board vision says that it's five pawns against five. My analysis tells me rook g6 check, king takes f5, rook takes g7. And then white's threatening to take on c7. Black will win the pawn on e6. And we'll probably get something like rook and two against rook and three or rook and three against rook and three. There we go. Yes, this is exactly what we were expecting. And he guards the pawn, takes check, and he decides it's going to be rook and two against rook and two. They could already agree to a draw. There they go, getting ready to repeat the position and game is drawn. Okay, so board vision. Now let's let's look at Levitt's book, Genius in Chess. What he found in that book is that even among highly rated players, when you ask them questions like, how many checks does White have? How many maiden ones does he have? How many legal moves does he have? 
that even when players are up in 2300, 2400, 2500, 2600, there's actually a difference in board vision. And he gives some of the puzzles that he gave some of these players. I have one of them in my library. I can call it up right away. Let's do that here. And before I show it to you, what I want you to do is, if you'd like to take part in this puzzle, there's going to be two numbers that you're going to show. I think I might have shown this in an earlier video, but in any case, you're going to come up with two numbers as fast as you possibly can because the, the way to score people is how accurate these two numbers are and how fast these two numbers are given. So we're looking for two integers. The first number we're looking for is how many legal moves White has. I haven't put up the position yet. I just want to tell you what you're going to do. How many legal moves White has. And the second one is how many of those moves are checkmate. All right, you ready? What, I, what I'm going to do when I show this is you can pause the video, come up with those two numbers, how many legal moves White has and how many are checkmate, and then you can unpause the video and I'll, I'll give you the answer. Oops, wrong one. Let's get the right one again. All right, here it is. Give me the two numbers. How many legal moves does White have and how many of them are checkmate? Go. All right, I assume you paused the video and came up with the two numbers. Let's do it in real time. The best way to do this is to ask how many moves, how many pieces of white can actually move? Well, let's take a look. This pawn on f4 is pinned by the rook, so it can't move. The knight on c6 is pinned by the bishop, so it can't move. So the only pieces that really can move are the knight on e3, the rook on d2, the bishop on b3, and the queen on a3. Let's take those circles off the board. So let's do each piece and see how many moves it has. Well, a knight on e3 normally has eight moves in the middle of the board. Is a, uh, the only way you could block a move is if there's a white piece on that square or if the knight's pinned. Well, the knight's not pinned. And all the eight squares that knight can move to are not occupied by white pieces. So therefore, that knight has all eight moves. So that knight has eight. How about the rook on d2? The rook on d2 can move in four directions. Up it has six, down it has one, left it has two, right it has one. So that's 10. The bishop on b3 has five to the upper right, two to the lower right, that's seven. The queen has two to the upper right and two to the lower right, that's four. So if we add up those numbers, eight and 10 is 18, seven is 25, four is 29. White has 29 legal moves. Okay, how many are checkmate? Well, maybe the first question we should ask is, how many are not checkmate? Well, suppose we put our queen checkmate. on b4. Is that checkmate? Well, the knight is, that's guarding the queen is pinned, but according to the rules of chess, the king still can't take the queen because theoretically the knight would take the king before the bishop takes his king. That's at least the somewhat the idea of that. So queen to b4 is guarded by the knight, even though the knight's pinned to the king, and that is checkmate. But all the other moves are checkmate. All the discoveries with the knight, checkmate, checkmate with the rook, and we don't have any king moves. All these rook moves are checkmate with the bishop discovery. All these bishop moves checkmate. are checkmate. The bishop is guarded by the knight. He can't take it. Queen here is guarded by the checkmate. rook. Queen here, check. The king checkmate. can't go to b4 because... Even though the knight's pinned, it's guarding that square. So it turns out the right answer is 2929. Okay, let me pause the video and put another one in from the book. Hold on. All right, here's another one that's a little harder. We want two numbers. How many legal moves does white have? And how many of those moves are checkmate? And I'll give you a hint. The number of moves that a piece, that a, that a piece has is not always exactly the same as the number of squares that it can go to. So that's a hint. Okay, so take your time here. We're at, well, I shouldn't say take your time. As fast as you can, give me the two numbers. How many legal moves does white have and how many are checkmate? Go. All right, I assumed that you paused the video and you did that if uh, you wanted to play along with us. This one's a lot harder. Okay, because obviously not all the moves are checkmate. But the reason I said not every square a piece can go to is equal to the number of moves it has is when a pawn promotes, every promotion that it could do is a different move. So for instance, if white plays a8 and gets a queen, 
That's different than a8 getting a knight, a8 getting a bishop, and a8 getting a rook. Those are four different moves, although there's only one different square he's going to. So you can't just say a8 is a move, because a 8s not the full move. It's either a8 knight, a8 bishop, a8 queen, a8 rook. So how many moves does white have like that where he can promote a pawn? Well, he's got one, two, three, four. Well, each one has four moves. So there's four squares times four. There's 16 pawn moves by those pawns. So if you got that wrong, then you're probably in the majority. And I know that then people curse at me and say, you know, Dan, you can't do that. And the answer is, well, that's how they count moves. Sorry. Um, <laughs> wasn't my idea. All right, so, so that's 16. How many other pawn moves does white have? One, two, three. All right, so white has 19 pawn moves. Let's see how many moves he has with all the other pieces. Let's take the lines off the board. We'll start with the king. We've got one, two, three king moves. So there's 19 pawn moves, three king moves. All right. I'm just writing this down so we can add it up quickly. Now let's do queen moves. All right, we've we got eight different directions for the queen. We got one, four, five, seven, nine, thirteen, fourteen. Looks like fourteen queen moves. Okay, queen equals fourteen. Write that one down. All right. Now we've got rook moves, all right? Rook's move in four different directions. We got seven here, eight, and this guy's got the full 14. 14 and eight is 22, so we got 22 rook moves. Okay, bishop moves, bishop in the middle of the board normally has 13 moves, there's no nothing blocking him. So he's got 13, this guy over here only has three. So we've got three and 13 is 16 bishop moves. And finally, knight moves. As we said, knights have all the squares they can go to unless there's a white piece on it. This knight has four. This knight normally has eight, but he's blocked by the bishop. So he's probably got seven. So we got four and seven is 11, 11 knight moves. So we got 19 and three is 22, 36, 58, 74, 85. So according to my calculations, White has 85 legal moves. He can't castle, he can't play on passant, nothing special like that, but he does have a bunch of under promotions that you have to count. Okay, now we have to figure out how many of those moves are checkmate. Okay, that's not so easy. Let's start with how many pawn moves are checkmate. All right, if I push up the checkmate. pawn to e4, it says checkmate. All right, that's one. If I get a bishop or a queen on this diagonal, that looks like two more. If I get a rook or a queen over here, that looks like two more. If I take the rook and I get a bishop or a queen, that looks like two more. So it looks like I have seven pawn moves that are checkmate. All right, let's see how many queen moves are checkmate. Well, in order to be checkmate, they have to be a check. So queen here looks like checkmate. Checkmate. Queen here looks checkmate. like checkmate. Queen here looks checkmate. like checkmate. Uh, do I have any more? One, two, three, four. Checkmate. All right, so all my queen checks are checkmate. So that's four with the queen. Do I have any king moves that are checkmate? I'd have to make a discovery with the king to checkmate with a king move, and I don't see it. So neither king d8, king f7, or king f6 are checkmate. Okay, now we need bishop moves that are checkmate. Well, all these bishop moves, these 14 bishop moves, are discoveries with the queen, and they all look like they're going to be checkmate. So I don't see any that are not. So let's say there's 14 bishop moves there that are checkmate. This bishop has three moves, none of them are checkmate. So we've got 13 bishop moves that are checkmate. All right, now we need rook moves that are checkmate. Well, this rook can't move in checkmate. It would have to have a discovery with a knight, and we haven't gotten there yet. All, on the other hand, this rook has 14 moves, and they all have discovered check. Are they all guarded? Yes, if the rook checkmate. goes here, the knight is guarding it. If the checkmate. rook goes here, the pawn is guarding it. 
the rook Check goes here, mate. the bishop's guarding it. If the rook goes here, Check the queen's mate. guarding it. So therefore, all, four, all, all 14 moves of that rook are checkmate. So we have 14 mates with that rook. Okay, now we have knight moves. Well, knight c7 and knight f6 look like checkmate. And now this knight has seven moves. Are any of them not checkmate? They're all discoveries. Can the king go to any squares? Can the king take anything? I don't see it, so I think all those discoveries are mate. So the only knight move that's not, the only two knight moves that are not mate are knight g7 and knight d6. So we've got nine, nine out of the 11 knight moves are mate. So that's what I have calculated. So now we have a total of 11, 25, 38, 47. Okay, so 12, 36, 58, 74. So 85 total moves of which 47 are checkmate. That's my guess. I didn't look up the answer, but if you're watching the video, and again, you, this is from the book Genius and Chess by Levitt, uh, that would be the answer. We would not expect you to get that answer very quickly. If you got the answer 8547, even if it took you 10 minutes, that's pretty darn good. And if I messed up, which is very possible because I didn't look up the answer, I'm just doing it live for you so you could see how I did it. Uh, that's possible that I missed something. So uh, very good. And if you did it, if you, if you got anything near 85 and 47, and you did, were able to do it in less than five minutes, that's pretty darn good board vision. Okay, so today we've talked about some of the differences between visualization and board vision. If you improve your board vision, I'm betting anything that you'll be improving your visualization as well. Those two things just seem to go hand in hand. And when you improve your visualization, you improve your analysis skills. And when you improve your analysis skills, then you get to be a better chess player. And that's what the video series is all about. Okay, thanks for hanging in with me. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed today's video. And we'll, if you can give a, a recommendation to your friends to watch my video series. You can like the video. You can subscribe. All those things are great. And we'll see you next time. Bye.